Welcome to today's webinar, Gearing Up for Social Impact. My name is Megan Wanless, and I'm a community animator at the Tamarack Institute. I am very pleased to be able to introduce our two webinar guests this afternoon, Tim Draymond and Brenton Caffin. Tim Draymond is the Executive Director of Social Innovation Generation, SIG National. SIG is a partnership of the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation, Toronto's Mars Discovery District, and the University of Waterloo. SIG acts as a catalyst for strengthening the enabling ecosystem for social innovations to be able to go to scale and generate whole system change. Tim is the founding CEO of Tides Canada Foundation and serves on the board of Trico Charitable Foundation and Social Innovation Exchange, and is a member of the International Council of Partnership Brokers Association, as well as the Scientific Advisory Board of Grand Challenges Canada. Tim is a senior advisor to the Mars Centre for Impact Investing and will be leading our interview today with Brenton Caffin. Brenton is Nesta's Director of Innovation Skills. He leads Nesta's work in helping people and organizations get better at innovating for the common good. Brenton is an innovative and strategic thinker and regularly pre pre presents to and advises national and global organizations, including UN agencies, on a wide range of issues relating to social and public sector innovation. He is an advisor to the Adelaide Festival of Ideas and former board member of the Global Social Innovation Exchange and the Institute for Public Administration Australia. From 2009 to 2012, Brenton was the founding CEO of the Australian Centre for Social Innovation and previously held executive positions within the South Australian Department of the Premier and Cabinet, Government Reform Commission and Work Cover. We're very much looking forward to listening to today's discussion, so with that I will pass it over to you, Tim. Thanks very much, Megan, and hi, everybody. Hi, Brenton. So, hi, Brenton, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just start with the first question uh, that I have. On the Nesta website, uh, your organization is described as, quote, an innovation charity with a mission to help people and organizations bring great ideas to life. You're working in such areas as citizen engagement, digital arts and media, government innovation and innovation policy, future thinking, impact investing, among others. Can you tell us a little bit more about this work and the role that Nesta is playing in UK society? Sure. Um, so Nesta uh, was established around 18 years ago uh, with an endowment from our big lottery fund in the UK. Um, and over that time, it's gone through a, a number of different um, evolutions. Uh, and today, it's a it's quite a unique mix uh, of, of, of different uh, different types of organisation all under one roof. Um, on one hand, uh, we have a, a policy and research team uh, that's about forty strong, uh, so effectively a part think tank that looks at public and social innovation. It looks at uh, innovation for economic growth future technologies, um, and, uh, and so that, that's one, one way in which we, uh, we try and uh, create uh, impact around innovation in the UK. Um, we also have an impact investment team um, that not only looks after our endowment, but also uh, creates new impact funds where we invest our own money, uh, as well as um, other impact investors uh, across a range of areas, including education, aging, and, and the arts. Um, we have our, our own innovation lab, uh, which designs programs and campaigns um, and creates uh, grant funding opportunities uh, to support the testing out of different innovations um, in, our, in our society. Um, and then we have my team, which is the innovation skills team. Uh, and as, as was said in the introduction, our, our job is to help people and organizations get better at doing innovation. Uh, and so in essence, we try and demystify innovation to break it down and talk simply about it rather than adding to uh, hot air and empty language and help people think about how they can put these methods and approaches into their work uh, to create greater social impact. Well, um, that's great. That's really a broad sweep of stuff and I've had the the real pleasure of being able to visit you at Nesta and uh, have a sense of the organization and the people that work there. I guess what's really interesting is that Nesta started with a domestic focus but has now expanded to actually have international partnerships. So could you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create the DIY toolkit and, and what were the criteria that you used uh, in, in uh, completing it? Sure, sure. Um, I guess uh, the, the inspiration for DIY um, 
came from a conversation that we started about three or four years ago uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation, um, who themselves have, have been big supporters of uh, innovation around the world, particularly uh, in the sort of development context. Um, we saw big and growing demand in international development for proven innovation tools and methods. People were looking for some support and guidance about where to start. Um, and so we were trying to, I guess, bridge the gap between uh, the worlds of innovation and the world of development uh, as, as part of our overall mission for um, demystifying innovation. Um, we knew that there was a lot of material out there. Uh, so in fact, the job wasn't so much to create tools and methods, um, but actually to, uh, to try and help people navigate these. The vast number of them was quite overwhelming. Um, and, and actually for busy people, uh, they didn't have the, the time to actually go through and, and do the due diligence on what was good, what was bad, uh, and where to start. So effectively our value add was to try and kind of bring some, uh, make some sense of that crowded space and to kind of curate what we thought was a, a best of breed um, collection. So starting with around 700 tools that we found on our first uh, scan, uh, we researched and evaluated uh, and then tested the best tools that we could find. Um, we assessed each tool on its practicality, uh, on its ease of use, on how visually engaging it, it was, um, evidence of impact, um, things like net promoter score, so would people actually promote this, you know, uh, the use of this tool to their colleagues. Um, and then we co-designed a first prototype uh, and we tested that with development prof professionals uh, in India and, and then subsequently to about 17 countries to be sure that the innovation approaches and the language that we use actually translated into development situations. That's great. So you actually tried to use a kind of social innovation approach as you were pulling all these things together. What, what are the, Absolutely. Yeah. What, what are the core building blocks um, for DIY's approach to innovation? Um, so I guess, I mean, I mean our, our high level message is that our approach to innovation is that everyone has the ability to innovate. We just need to make it tangible and accessible. So when we looked at these tools, we started by organizing them uh, along the sort of innovation journey. Um, at one of Nesta's organizing frameworks we use is the innovation spiral you can see on the slides, um, which is just one representation of many for describing the kind of journey you might go on from exploring different opportunities or particular challenges you might be facing to creating ideas or potential responses to that, uh, to that challenge, developing and testing your ideas, and then building the case for actually making it real in the world, implementing that, growing and scaling it, and ultimately leading to system change. So we, we, we took the tools that we found and we, uh, we sort of matched them against this innovation spiral. Um, however, when we spoke to the people that you know that we intended we intended to use the toolkit, uh, we we realised that they don't necessarily self-identify as innovators and aren't necessarily looking for a beginning-to-end process to walk through, and so this structure didn't really sort of resonate for them. So we actually carved up our innovation process into more sort of typical activity requirements that development professionals often seek support with, and we mapped those tools uh, the tools against those needs. So rather than following a prescriptive process or methodology, the, the, the innovation tools that we put in the toolkit um, are basically then become more relevant at people's moment of need. So in a sense, you're really basically trying to create a platform that gives people total ultimate control over how they kind of mix and match the tools and bring things together for their own particular challenges. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the toolkit you might have in your garage, um, it doesn't necessarily come with an 80-page instruction sheet because you don't yet know what you're going to build. So actually what you need is you need a screwdriver in some sense of in what situations a screwdriver might be handy. Great. And for folks who haven't actually gone in and uh, played around with the toolkit, um, how have you organized the information and uh, would you have uh, any advice for somebody coming at this for the first time? Sure. Um, I mean, I'd like to say, and with, with the help of the design team that we worked with, um, it's fairly intuitive, so <laughs> have, have a play would be my, my first advice. But um, just to sort of talk it through, um, the, the tools and the, the related content are, are, are structured by areas of need or indeed jobs to be done. You can see this on the, the, uh, the slide in front of you. So hopefully users can kind of locate themselves in the toolkit by 
recognizing their area of need, um, what are you actually trying to do at each particular moment, and then under each of those need statements, it leads to a very specific tool, very much like a decision tree. Uh, we've provided a suggested tool to support with individual activity requirements. So for instance, I want to develop a clear plan on how to grow my idea would lead you to the business model canvas. Um, each tool then has a short animated tutorial uh, to introduce how and why the tool is useful with an applied case study. Uh, and there are free PDF downloads uh, on each of those pages. Um, you can download it from between A1 and A4 size. Um, so for use in uh, workshops, individual working, um, or in team situations. Yeah, so A1 to A4, those are the different formats for pages in uh, Europe and North America, right? That's right. Okay, so um, the toolkit was, uh, I guess, originally launched in March 2014, and uh, from what I understand, it's had nearly 750,000 hits and 100,000 downloads from people in over 200 countries and territories. Would you be able to share with us any examples of how groups or individuals have been using this toolkit to improve their work? Yeah, I mean, as you say, I mean that that we were kind of a little bit astonished um, by the the sort of the growth of the toolkit. I'm pleasantly surprised, um, uh, and in fact, um, currently we've got 14 translations either completed or or underway um, from Mandarin, Arabic, through French. Russian, Spanish, uh, and so on. Um, so, I mean, I think what uh, it really spoke to us was that it helped to sort of advance this big idea that actually the, it was the right time for innovation to be to democratized, to actually open up access to materials and, and uh, these opportunities for people around the world. Um, it was designed as a dip in, dip out resource for individuals to access at their moment of need. And, um, I, you know, we've been successful in activating a large number of people, but I mean, to be fair, it's, um, it's actually been quite difficult to track and monitor how they're using the tools. Um, we were very uh, lucky that a number of organizations um, have, um, we've worked with to um, uh, document exactly how they've used it and what difference it's made in their organizations. We've also got some uh, valuable institutional partnerships with organizations like Oxfam, uh, the UN Development Program, USAID, Global Giving, Ushahidi, and indeed Ashoka. Uh, and we've been working with them to kind of hardwire the tools uh, into their programs and learning initiatives. Uh, so for example, uh, the toolkit underpins the Global Giving Effectiveness Dashboard, which means that uh, civil, service, uh, civil society organizations can improve their project performance rating if they demonstrate applications of the tools and new learning as a result of that. Uh, similarly, making all voices count uh, which is a, 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 um, a program managed by Ushahidi, encourages all applicants to use the DIY tools to support their applications and pitch presentations. And the feedback from them has been that the quality of applications is significantly higher than when they first opened in 2013. Uh, and in fact, just today, um, I heard um, from the team that uh, there's an NGO in uh, Nepal called Childreach in Nepal, uh, run by a, a young global leader from the World Economic Forum. They've actually adopted DIY is kind of the core of their professional development framework, um, and so they're using the tools and the learning modules, which we'll come on to, uh, to actually guide um, the, the entire professional development of their NGO. And I should actually also put a shout out to the Canadian uh, institutional partners, including SIG, uh, the McConnell Family Foundation, and InnoWeave, who've also helped us to promote this. Great, um, and just wanted to check, in terms of those 14 translations you mentioned, uh, was is French among one of the 14? It was, it is, yes. It should be out imminently. Great. Imminently, okay, because um, if you could let us know about that, that would be terrific. And in terms of the partnerships that you are mentioning that you've established with some organizations, would, are you still open to people approaching you about new partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, it's a very, um, we have a very, uh, if you like, low barrier to entry for people who want to sort of help us to promote this. Um, I mean, ideally to become a partner, um, you're willing to tell your networks about it, um, you're willing to help us gather case studies, um, and you're willing to help us, you know, work on further evolutions and, and um, uh, re uh, new, new additions of the, the toolkit when we come around to sort of uh, reviewing it. Okay, 
And um, just on this topic, I realize that uh, I should also ask you, uh, obviously you're somebody who in your own career, you worked in the public sector, you worked in the nonprofit sector, uh, developing taxi. And I know we all, you know, hindsight is 2020. But uh, when you were putting together the toolkit, were there moments which you saw a tool and you said to yourself, my goodness, I really could have used that at this particular point when I was working on developing this project or this organization? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, when I when I joined uh, Nesta three years ago, um, we, the, the, the research piece of this uh, had already started, but when I looked at the, the long list and certainly when we tried to get it down to a short list, there were... There were certainly uh, tools that I was very familiar with and used quite a lot um, from service design and sort of business strategy like the business model canvas. Um, there was actually some that were completely new to me and I, and I you know, uh, it had been, I, I, yeah, I wish I'd seen those earlier. So in a sense, um, that sort of use case was, was one of many that I kept in the back of my head um, when we tried to think about um, what would be useful. In a sense, we didn't try to make this comprehensive because actually that way leads to an encyclopedia that has too many tools and becomes too difficult to get your head around. But what we wanted to do was to have almost like a, a very good starter pack. Um, if you were to sort of head into the jungle with only a certain amount of tools in your in your backpack, which would be the might get you through 80% of the situations rather than designing for every occasion. Right, and you've just given a great example of one of the tools that you highlight, the business model canvas, which is probably I guess I think of it almost as the platinum model of a new tool uh, that has scaled in terms of its impact so quickly around the world. And I guess people who find it through you then can go and discover all the support system that's out there f for uh, the business model canvas. Yeah, absolutely. We were very uh, quick to recognize we were sort of standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, that this was designed to be uh, a sort of a touchdown point, if you like, to locate yourself and to think about what tools were useful. Um, but on, on each of the pages of the tools, we reference you know, who were the originators. Um, and at the back of the toolkit, there's a full list of references to guide people if they really want to sort of dig deeper into, um, into this material. Okay, so there's a question that's popped up, and I know we were going to get to questions a little later on, but I might just stick this one in the queue here because it kind of fits. And it comes from uh, um, Alice and Hewitt, who's, who's wondering, Brenton, how context-specific is the toolkit? And uh, is, you know, what, what, what have you seen is the work that people are required to, to use to, to make the tools culturally uh, or locally relevant? Yeah, um, it's a good question, Alison. Thank you for listening. <laughs> you, you did warn us for giving some curly questions. Um, I, we, I mean, we did a lot of testing, as I mentioned, about 17 or 19 countries during the user testing to ensure that um, we were trying to present the material in a fairly universal way, um, a, a way that would translate into a number of different uh, circumstances. Um, also, obviously, with the translations, we get an opportunity to be even uh, a little bit more um, specific using you know, language and frames that might make more sense. Um, in uh, in different parts of the world. Um, that said, I mean, many of these tools, um, you know, are designed, um, you know, have have been designed as, as quite universal tools. A lot of the service design tools from the IDEO uh, design kit um, were designed to be sort of fairly universal. Um, but we encourage people to take them uh, and to use them as a jumping off point if they want to sort of change. Uh, the language, they want to change what's in, uh, you know, how these uh, different tools are described or what you do, you put in certain boxes um, to, to, to actually freeform. So um, we encourage that and, you know, we, we'd love to see, you know, what other variants people come up with over time. Okay, great. Um, now, the, I think we, we talked about you founded it in uh, March 2014, so it's just, uh, just past its uh, second birthday. And as you think back on the last couple of years, what have been the ma some of the major impacts that you've seen emerge from the toolkit? And, and I guess, you know, looking into the future, how, how do you see the toolkit evolving? And uh, have you found that you're kind of docking with an ecosystem of other providers? Is there a kind of um, global community of DIY-type organizations that, that you're working with? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the first, I guess, reflection is um, uh, that when we're we're very very pleased and and um, uh, excited that the, the toolkit has become a, a pretty um, leading resource in the sector, um, a bit of a go-to resource, if you like. Um, there's a bit of brand recognition of sorts around it, um, and it's helped to empower people working in very diverse places uh, to actually get on board and to practically support uh, innovation. Um, we've been really excited about our ability to bring these sector-leading organizations together in a network to endorse and to spread the material, um, which I think in turn has given credibility uh, to our voice, but it's also helped to embed uh, the toolkit more deeply into different organizations' way of working. Uh, so rather than just being um, one charity sitting in London saying this is what you ought to think about, um, we're, we're, we're actually you know, trying to reflect uh, the, the views of, of, of many organizations in this, in this space that are, are very keen to see innovation spread. Um, that said, I mean, it was designed for the international development sector, but um, the, the tools in here are universally applicable and it's being used by people in many different sectors. Um, we know it's being used in uh, the public sector context. We know it's being used in business schools. Um, uh, and I think it's, you know, it's testament to the design team that we partnered with, um, Quicksand and Standby, who helped us build a, frankly, a very um, intuitive and uh, e easy on the eye and easy to use toolkit that, that you know, means that people keep coming back um, and rather than necessarily needing to develop their own um, versions, they're quite happy to use ours. Um, you know, for us, it's become um, one of our sort of flagship um, products that we put out there to help people to innovate. Um, it's been a, bit, been a bit of a calling card for a lot of the work that we do in the innovation skills team and it's led us to have uh, many, many different conversations in, uh, around the world um, about supporting innovation projects in ways that we, we might not have uh, foreseen or even imagined in our wildest dreams. Um, we also learned a lot about how to generate the content and to do product development, which is helping us to inform our future work. The user testing, um, you know, uh, crowdsourcing the original list of tools, getting the feedback from the field before, you know, as part of the refining uh, of the product and then building a community around it is something that we hope to, to replicate uh, in future. Um, and I guess one of, one of the frequent pieces of feedback we get is actually about the humility of the toolkit. Um, that, you know, a lot of, the, the, there's a temptation to over-promise um, around innovation and for things to be, you know, the latest and greatest and actually in a way this was designed as a very humble piece of kit which we hope might be a useful starting point for a conversation rather than the last word uh, in innovation. Um, and for us it was the sort of um, the jumping off point for a, for a longer conversation and intervention in, in the development sector. Um, so with that in mind it's always been framed as a sort of constant collaborative work in progress which means that uh, all the people who've contributed and continue to contribute take significant ownership of it going forward. That's great. Uh, one of the things that I reflect on about your work is that you came at this um, coming from Australia where you started the, really the first national Australian organization um, supporting the development of a of a stronger, uh, I guess, deeper approach to innovation for solving uh, social issues. And um, I think it's fair, fair to say that um, innovation isn't the strongest part of the social sector's DNA yet. Um, we're still working on strengthening that muscle. Um, how has your experience in developing uh, a DIY toolkit and your um, I guess, uh, working relationships and interfacing with your different partners as you're developing it. Um, what has that uh, led you to reflect on in terms of where we're at in terms of this, I guess, cultural shift or mindset shift um, that opens up uh, thinking inside of existing organizations to entertain more innovative approaches? Yeah, I mean, I guess one of my reflections is um, uh, and, and, and I guess there are parallels with the social sector and the development sector is, is to be wary of innovation imperialism. Um, that this isn't about trying to impose um, a, you know, a, a different approach to sort of stop what you're doing and what you've been doing for 40 years and start doing this. Actually what we're trying to do is to sort of reconcile and build on 
good practice within those sectors, but at the same time, um, uh, surfacing um, different you know methods and tools that um, can be used in their day job um, to do things in a different way um, without without kind of um, uh, yeah ask, you know dragging everyone back to first principles. Um, actually, there's a lot of good work that has gone on. In fact, you know, in, in other conversations, we've talked about you know some service design principles in innovation of you know drawing on participatory action methods, which have been used in you know development uh, arena for 30 and 40 years. So um, I think that sort of coming in from a, um, a position of humility um, um, and actually, but at the same time, trying to um, uh, invite people to apply different approaches to their work. Um, to give them, the, I guess, the confidence to sort of try some different things, um, and the the ability in this toolkit to um, uh, allow people to to take those sort of initial steps to try different things, to sort of potentially approach the problem from different ways, to think about their audience in different ways, you know, to test and iterate their ideas in different ways, um, you know, hopefully can um, bring some, uh, you know, additional. Uh, and value and, and, and impact to these sectors, but without without doing so from a from an arrogant perspective. Well, well, speaking about how organizations um, wrap their arms around these tools, and um, I guess as you're saying, use them in the way that's appropriate for them, building on the assets that they've already developed. I guess one of an, an interesting question is uh, the the kind of roles of different parts of an organization, the staff who I guess many of us would think, oh, the, the, this is geared towards the staff. But I'd uh, just also be interested in, to know if you have had any feedback about how the governance structures of some of your partners um, have, been, have been using this in terms of, uh, uh, of using it to spark the conversation throughout the organization, including its board or other kind of advisory structures, about how it's approaching uh, achieving its mission. Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think one of the experiences that that I've seen is actually more about how do we help more guerrilla innovation. <laughs> so actually, how do we help people to um, without having to kind of, you know, um, set up a new capital I innovation program? How do we within their existing work and their existing projects and budget lines and responsibilities, nonetheless, actually start to sort of approach the the you know the issues and challenges they face? Um, you know, from a different from a different angle. Um, so, a large piece of work that, that we've been doing increasingly is is actually helping people create space within existing um, operational paradigms to um, to generate uh, new ideas. So, um, rather than having to go to the top of the office and sort of trying to change policy, how can we actually use some of the the, the sort of um, the blind spots, or how can we interpret um, policy in such a way that enables us to kind of actually use a lot of these methods, and thus we actually get the innovation without having to kind of go to the top of the office and, and try and sort of you know um, uh, advocate for sort of radical change. Um, so that's something that we've seen quite a bit of. Um, uh, I'm, yeah, I can't think of I, I can't think of any situations off the top of my head about where people have used this to kind of spark conversations at board level. But that might just be because um, they haven't shared them with us yet. Okay, um, but I think you you raised the, the whole notion around guerrilla innovation is really interesting. Like, where do people get purchase or gain some traction? You know, and I you use the term guerrilla innovation. I know John Carter talks about um, you know how can an organization create a secondary operating system inside or really a skunk shop to try to do some of this stuff. I guess that's what you're alluding to. How do people continue to do the uh, core mission related work at the same time as um, as kind of creating a little bit of protective space for this experimentation yeah yeah I think I think that's right I mean in a way um, I guess you know one one answer is um, you know you know frankly this is just a toolkit um, <laughs> you know it, it, it that there's a lot more that goes into how do you create effective innovation um, and some of that's around uh, governance and some of that's around people. Uh, you know capabilities and skills. Some of that's about um, creating the right authorizing environment to try and do different things. And sometimes you get that officially. Sometimes you create it um, by staying under the radar. Um, and so it's a combination of a lot of these things. Um, 
yes, there's some kind of methods, uh, and obviously some of those we've captured in the toolkit, but there's, a, I guess, a, a much richer story around that in terms of how do we support individuals and teams and organizations to uh, think about how they um, build up the, the muscle memory to try these approaches out and to give themselves the sort of confidence to try and experiment and iterate and fail and improve. That's great. Well, I think a related question to what we're talking about now is one that's uh, popped up from John Kenny, who's asked if you have any advice for public servants using service design methods like the DIY toolkit. Um, learning by doing is awesome, but sometimes skills and methods need to align well with the complexity of the challenges we face. How can we build the capacity for these type of methods? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, and in a sense, um, uh, when when you think about sort of learning a new approach, um, you know the sort of the, the, the bottom of the pyramid is understanding what what you know what the tool or approach is. Um, over time, you then build up greater mastery of it so that you can then apply it in a range of circumstances. And then, as you build further mastery, you can then adapt and improvise to actually um, you know adapt to novel circumstances or more complex circumstances, you can actually take these things and apply them to the situation that um, most, you know, meets your needs. Um, I mean, the answer is, um, you know, is, 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 is practice. Um, it's also sharing um, uh, experiences with, with, you know, with, with peers and communities. So, um, you know, I think uh, we do quite a lot of work, um, you know, helping to public servants think about approaching, applying these methods in their work. And, and we find that um, you know, creating peer reflection groups um, uh, to sort of accelerate people's learning. So it's not just learning by doing, but it's also sharing from other people's mistakes and hearing about how they've been applied in a range of quite complex situations um, can, can often accelerate people's learnings. Um, I mean, I should say a bit going off piste here, but um, uh, we, we're actually doing a piece of work at the moment on public service um, competencies. Uh, so what are the comp skills and competencies you need to be an effective public service innovator? Uh, it's a piece of work we're doing with the OECD, and we hope to um, have that framework uh, launched in the summer. Um, so hopefully we'll have a little bit more to say on that in the next few months. That's great. Uh, just wondering if I could just delve a little bit into what you just mentioned a second ago about uh, peer reflection reflection groups, um, and um, it's really a kind of modality to be able to use these tools to be to work with with others. And I think a lot of us feel that uh, uh, peer reflection groups or, or peer learning circles is probably one of the greatest um, uh, insufficiently used resources we have to really ramp up our ability to strengthen our impact. Um, do you have some specific examples of how people could put together these peer reflection groups? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, so for, I mean, this may not be an example that's, that's ready, readily translatable, but I'm sure you can draw your own um, sort of analogies from this. Uh, last year, uh, we ran a, a global gathering for innovation labs. Uh, from around the world. We had about 300 people from about 50 labs come to London. Um, and um, the first day was your fairly standard kind of very full conference format. Uh, the second day was a little bit more unconferency uh, chance to kind of share what different labs were doing with other practitioners. But on the weekend, we, we basically booked out Nesta's um, conference room. Uh, we would have loved to have gone to a nice countryside retreat, but uh, there was none available, so we had to stay in, in central London. Um, we booked out our, our sort of um, our meeting room conference rooms here, and we had 16 labs uh, hang back for the weekend, and to really think about all of the, the sort of the fresh stimulus that they'd received over those two days. Um, obviously, they were thinking about what that meant for, for them and their labs. A lot of them were just starting out. And we spent two days effectively in a, in a sort of a coaching and peer reflection space. There was not a huge amount of instruction. It, was, it wasn't about giving them more input. It was actually just about creating space for them to think through what this meant for them. And, and in that, we actually used a number of the tools from problem definition to theory of change um, and personas to kind of actually really help people think about 
well, what what is actually the real problem you're trying to address here? Why why does this lab exist? What 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 does success look like? Um, how do you know whether the activities that um, you, that you're doing are actually driving towards the the bigger the larger impact that you hope to have? Um, and how much do you really understand your audience and the reasons why they might or might not choose to engage with you? Um, and using some of those simple tools with a lot of time around that for people to, to think and to get feedback from peers, but also for mentoring organizations like Nesta and MindLab in Denmark, organizations that have been in the space for a decade or more um, to kind of share all the things that we've got wrong um, to try and help people um, accelerate through that. But um, that was a very, uh, very useful time. Um, as I say, we spent a couple of days, we had dinner the night between, which also allows for a different style of conversation. Um, and that's something that you know we, we definitely would uh, look at running again. Wow, that's a really interesting example of, uh, in a sense, having an educational forum and following it up with actually people uh, unpacking what they've been discussing and learning and uh, kind of going much deeper in it. That's a great example. Um, I've got a, another question, uh, this one from uh, David Pluff, and he's interested in knowing um, what has surprised you about the DIY toolkit? Mm. Um, what surprised us about the toolkit? Um, I think, well, I mean, the, the, the volume of people using it um, uh, was, was surprising. I, I think <clears throat> it's fair to say I think we set a target of 50,000 people, 50,000 downloads in our first year, and I think we got somewhere like about 10 times that. Um, so, you know, um, it obviously struck a nerve, um, and that I, I think I put down to three things. It was the you know the good design from um, the, the partners we had it was the user testing which meant that it actually was relevant for people um, and the sort of the, the sort of partners we had around it who really helped to sort of spread it into um, some very very large and diverse networks so that so the uptake was was a, a pleasant surprise um, I think um, the desire to translate it into lots of different languages um, you know actually goes to the point that Alison the question she raised earlier about people wanting to make it as local as possible, um, and indeed that that's sort of something that we're continuing to give some thought to. Um, we've, you know, in our first sort of couple of years, we, we were invited out a lot to run DIY workshops and trainings, and um, we did some of that because we wanted to test out how the materials would work in a workshop context. And obviously, we use a lot of these in our own in our own work, but we're not geared up to spend all our time racing around the world doing one-off workshops. So. Um, it's given us a lot of pause for thought as to kind of what the might, what the best um, uh, ecosystem might be that we need to build to ensure that um, we we have not only the materials but we also have the connection to um, you know people in real life face to face situations can, who can help people to um, to um, make sense of this in their own local context uh, and to put it to good use. Great. Well, that's a thank you. That's a great answer to the question. And also, you included in that, I guess, the three um, key uh, success factors for you around the good design, the user test, and uh, and the quality of and of the partners and the relationship with partners. Um, in that answer, one of the things that I'm struck by, and you've alluded to earlier, is you come back uh, again and again to the whole question of design. And I know that uh, design is really one of the kind of core DNA elements of a social innovation approach, but it isn't one that I was exposed to very much. In all honesty, in all honesty, you know, earlier in my career before I got to social innovation, in a sense. And I think that the growing visibility of design and design thinking has been one of the really exciting parts of this whole field. Is there uh, some? thoughts and insights you have around the whole question of design and what that's meant for you in the DIY toolkit? Well, I mean, I guess, uh, so, you know, when, when we started Taxi uh, nearly seven years ago, um, design was kind of one of the sort of, uh, I guess, the early um, calls that we made about sort of what we needed to have in our method set. Um, to go out and sort of to radically redesign social services. So, um, in our work, we uh, our hypothesis was that there were um, there were parts of our, our public service systems, our social service systems, that had got stuck, 
Um, and if we were going to unstick them, we kind of needed to think about different methods uh, for doing so. And, and I think the, the I think the really nice point of connection between design and social innovation is really about that that user focus, really designing around the needs of the user. Um, very often in government, we design around the needs of the system, um, and so bringing design into a, the, into taxi, into a centre for social innovation, helped to ensure that we had a methodology that, that really prioritised the actual needs of the, the user, and built from that, uh, you know, ideas, solutions, ventures, um, um, projects that actually drives what they, the outcomes that they that really matter to them, and then builds backwards from that into solutions that we can we can implement and embed in systems. And so I guess that experience kind of was was quite sort of um, sort of formative uh, to my kind of entry into this sort of social innovation space. And uh, when when I joined Nesta and we were looking at uh, what should be in the in in the, in the backpack, um, clearly sort of the sort of service design tools were were sort of um, um, were quite high, but it also informed the way in which we went about designing the, the product as well. That it wasn't just about us sitting around our desks making you know um, crude assumptions about um, about you know what would work for people. We we put together a, a straw man and then we went out and we we tested it with people. And I think um, you know if if there's, if there's one thing I, I've I've learned in this space over the last few years is is about that. Getting out and speaking to users, and and you know, um, taking your assumptions and 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 really testing them, uh, and 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 holding your ideas fairly loosely, and be willing to um, to rework or even bin and start again um, once you sort of get the the feedback from the field. Yeah, uh, that reminds me of the the um, caution that I've heard again and again. Um, it's important to love the problem and uh, don't love the solution because you get married to a solution when it might not actually work. Um, I've got another question I was going to ask you, Brenton, but at the same time, I just wanted to put out the call to people that after this, after you answer this next question, we'll have time for uh, uh, questions and comments from people. So if people could uh, put those in their box, that would be great. But um, one of the things, I, I guess the final question I have for you right now at this point is, um, just to uh, mention that uh, you've recently announced a partnership with the Open University. In a sense, you're taking the DIY uh, to another level, going from the DIY toolkit to create a thing called DIY Learn. And DIY Learn um, seems to feature, I think it's got about 10 interactive bite-sized modules that, that focus on what you've decided are the most widely used tools and methods from the toolkit. Um, what are you hoping to do with DIY learning? Can you just tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. Um, yeah. So, the, I mean, the partnership with the Open University, um, which I should also say um, is, is further is further supported by um, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation as well. Um, it enables us to take innovation learning online uh, and to scale. Um, as I mentioned before, we um, there's a limit to how much we can do face to face from a, with a small team in London. Um, and so, with limited resources, we, we set ourselves a, a design challenge to how do we how do we reach ten times more people with a tenth of our input, thus giving percent uh, growth in, in scale. Um, you know, this project is, is will help us to get some of the way there. Um, our ambition is that the, these online modules will complement um, learning programs and initiatives that that already exist. Um, so these are basically two-hour um, sort of standalone modules on ten of the most popularly used tools. Um, we, we, we actually use the, uh, the web stats to sort of work out which they were um, and uh, to make sure that we, we started where, where people were, were, um, were, were, were already going. So it represents about 60% of the, the traffic uh, on the DIY toolkit but now has uh, online learning modules around them. And the idea is that they're, um, you can dip in, you can dip out of those, you can access those just in time if they're not a MOOC in the sense that you don't have to sign up for a six-week program. You can literally go home one night and decide, right, tomorrow I need to do a business model canvas. I'm going to spend a few hours boning up on what that is um, and come back the next morning and have a go. Um, they're also designed as plug-and-play content, so they can actually be syndicated to different providers to actually put into their own platforms. Um, it's all free to use, um, and uh, yeah, we, we, so we hope that uh, 
the content can actually live in many, many different places and, and more easily fit in with, with people's daily working practice. Um, our ultimate game is to, is, you know, aim is to um, uh, embed innovation in the everyday practice of organizations and, and we see this is a, a step in that direction. That's great. Are, are you going to make a, a have a tool in the toolkit that'll uh, help people evaluate how much they've in, embedded innovation in their culture? Uh, we don't have it there yet, but <laughs> maybe, maybe we should do it. We should do it next time. Um, yeah, uh, it, 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 evaluation is a, is a is a really it's a really interesting one, um, and we've thought a lot about different ways of evaluating what we're doing. Um, in fact. You know, the, the, the challenge with a lot of evaluation methodologies is they aren't easily reducible to a simple tool um, and, and we didn't necessarily want to oversimplify things that were a bit more complex. So there are some gaps and, uh, and actually you know, if, if people sort of spot other things we should be using, um, then at some point we are going to do a version 2.0 of the toolkit. So um, we'll be looking for people's uh, suggestions. I should also say in case there are any large funders out there, um, we've done the 10 modules um, based on the volume. We'd love to do more. Um, we've done as much as our funding will allow. So if anyone wants to see the next 10 um, uh, put onto open line, online learning modules, then um, please get in touch. <laughs> Great. I'm glad you're doing the pitch. Um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe I could switch now to uh, uh, one of the questions that's come in. And it is, uh, what is Nesta learning about how to incorporate the practices of the toolkit and innovation more generally into the everyday work of social organizations. Uh, what are some of the different models you've seen to take these tools into business as usual? And that's from Cal Joffrey. So, um, I mean, so we've, we've kind of seen a number of different approaches um, by different organizations, some of which we've had you know, closer involvement in uh, with than, than others. I, I mentioned a few on the way through. so building it into application processes um, for, for, for new grant applications. We've, we've seen them built into the professional development um, frameworks for, for NGOs. Um, some of the other organizations that we've worked with, um, we've taken a slightly different tack, which has been to um, recruit uh, and identify internal networks of innovation champions, and then to give them um, a little bit more um, guidance and support um, and the tools and approaches to not just do this work, but to be able to um, effectively support their colleagues uh, and to advocate its uptake um, across their organizations around the world. Um, and, and finally, and I, think I mentioned on the way through, but it bears repeating, I think one of the other quite interesting projects we've been working on with some large multilateral organizations has been how do they embed this into their existing operational sort of project policy paradigms so we're not having to kind of completely sort of change the oil tanker but nonetheless we're actually sort of embedding this in at sort of key sort of intervention moments over existing the existing sort of project cycle so we actually can get better outcomes without saying they have to sort of stop everything they're doing and start again. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. And uh, I have another question, uh, this time from <laughs> Alison Hewitt again. Um, and she's asking, does the DIY toolkit address some of the challenges of innovation? Or I guess she's saying what I, what I would call the dark side of innovation. You know, we always have unintended consequences of innovations that we don't anticipate. Um, and obviously we're not trying to, you're not trying to promote innovation for its own sake. But how can the tools be used to help people anticipate um, uh, negative um, outcomes um, that, 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 that might uh, be part of what happens? Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, there are, there are a number of tools in there that are designed to, um, I mean, I guess the underlying premise is, um, you know, to take, to, to, to generate, um, hypotheses or assumptions based on what you're seeing and experiencing to think about different ways that you could address those problems that you're seeing once you've defined them uh, effectively for an audience that you've kind of got priority around uh, and then to actually go and test and iterate. So in a sense, um, 
you know, I, I think, um, as you say, we're not promoting innovation for its own sake, but I think promoting the attempt to test and trial and improve ideas, um, I think, is, is in itself should become um, a, a bit of a um, uh, an inbuilt sort of defense mechanism for sort of boosterism. You know, this isn't about saying every idea you're going to come up with is going to be great and it should just be implemented because it's innovative. Actually, the idea probably at first, you know, may be wrong uh, or it may need refinement. And actually, by identifying the audiences you're working with, identifying your theory of change, articulating those assumptions and then testing those, um, you can hopefully ensure that you're, um, you're not going to sort of go down the wrong path. Yeah, so the whole notion of rapid rapid prototyping. So uh, we're coming up to the end of the time we have for the q and I've got one, one more question, and um, it's really about um, trying to, if, perhaps if you could review um, getting on the web to all these tools. You've mentioned the DIY Toolkit and DIY Learn. Could you just explain how DIY Learn can be accessed? Is it from yeah, within? If you, if you go to the DIY Toolkit uh, website, which is DIYToolkit.org, um, about halfway down on the right-hand side, there's a button that says DIY uh, Learn. Um, and it's probably easier to access it from that, from that page. Um, but there is a, 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 an open university uh, URL. Um, but if you actually look on the right-hand column, about halfway down, there's a DIY Learn uh, page. And if you click on that, uh, it says Go to Modules. There's a button on there that will take you to the uh, Open University website and all the courseware is in there. Okay. That's great. These have been great answers to the question, Brent, and I really, really appreciate it. We're, we're running out of time, but I see that uh, instead of a question, we've got a comment from Eric Yost, who's working on the White House Promise Zones Initiative in Los Angeles. And he says, uh, we use a collective impact model. We have used many of the tools for innovation in our work for comprehensive neighborhood revitalization in high poverty communities in central Los Angeles to solve problems around education, public safety, sustainable neighborhoods, and economic activity. Awesome toolkit. There you go. Thank you, Eric. That's great. <laughs> Well, listen, I think we've come to the end of the question period, so I just want to thank you again, um, Brenton, and just turn it back over to Megan. Yeah, thank you so much both to you, Tim, and Brenton for being a part of today's broadcast and for enlightening, enlightening us with all of this innovative thinking. And thank you all to who attended today as well and for your thoughtful questions. That was a great discussion. We love touch and encourage you to, describe, uh, to subscribe to our monthly e-newsletter, Engage, where you can read more about the latest articles around collective impact, collaboration, and community engagement, as well as keep up to date with more free webinar opportunities like this one, um, as well as our face-to-face -face learning events. We've also had some great upcoming events coming your way uh, that might be of interest to you. Deepening Community, Resilient Neighborhoods When People Care will be taking place this June 7th to 9th in Edmonton, Alberta. This is a workshop designed to inspire and rejuvenate. It has been designed to provide you with inspiration, connections, knowledge, and specific tools to deepen community, cultivate care, and create resilient neighborhoods. It'll explore topics from asset-based community development, uh, lessons from social innovation, rediscovering the act of care, and how community resilience is built, including much more. We're also excited to announce that the first ever Community Change Institute is being held in vibrant Toronto, Ontario this fall from September 26th to the 30th. Our cities, the places we live, provide amazing opportunities for resilience in these disruptive times. The Tamarack Institute team has worked over the last year to rethink and rebuild our annual five-day learning event to respond to this challenge. This event will bring you the latest in community change with top speakers and amazing faculty and over 40 workshops in the areas of collective impact, community engagement, collaborative leadership, community innovation, and evaluating community impact. So you can find out more about these opportunities that are coming up on our website at tamarackcommunity.ca.